You're tuned in to the Death Metal Chronicles show. Oh no, is it not monitoring? Crap. Uh, I'm so confused. Okay. Uh, crap. Hey, Gary, there. Can you hear me? Oh, shit. Okay, let me, uh... Let me figure this out. Okay. Line in. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I'm not able to hear you. Okay, so uh, headphones monitor. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Mm hmm. I've got to figure this out, so I've been trying to figure out how to, like, record with my, uh, with my recorder, and then also record my phone, but the only thing that I can do is, like, record directly from my phone to my recorder, and, oh, it's such a pain in the ass. But you can hear me fairly well? Yes, I can hear you well. You're tuned in to Death Metal Chronicles show. This is episode number 19. We're here with Ronan and Bull. So what's going on with you, Ronan? What's popping? Uh, just the usual stuff, just dealing with 25-degree weather. Let's see, both my parents got the flu, and which spread to my brothers, and now I'm just hacking and coughing as well. <laughs> That doesn't sound good at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm the guy that never gets sick unless everyone else in the home catches it first. Oh, shit, for real? Yeah. But I seem to fight everything off a lot better than everyone else. Yeah. So, uh, what's been going on with you? What's new uh, this week so far? Let's see. Just the usual stuff. Um, I, I did my... Um, my PR, my lifting record in, in Queens, in CrossFit. I forget how much I lifted, to be honest. I should be recording this, but I, I, really, I really don't. I, I just know that I lifted a lot more than the last time. Oh, yeah. And I just don't jot it down. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at that, to be honest. Very terrible. Um, let's see. I was... Um, I'm approving much better with my Bagua. Um, for those who don't know what Bagua is, it's a um, internal Chinese martial art that predates a lot of things. It's one, one of the oldest on the planet. Really? That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, everyone talks about Shaolin all the time, but a lot of people don't, don't really bring to light about the Taoist tradition and from the Wudang Mountains. And it's it's pretty how I put this um, the Shaolin stylists they have a tendency to focus more on the physical training aspects early on, whereas the Taoists they're a little bit more they move at a much slower pace. Interesting. Um, they they focus more on the internal internal energies, which is the breathing, moving very very soft and supple. And then the physical conditioning slowly catches up to that. But in the end, both trained schools of thoughts will meet at the same objective as far as training is concerned. But they're very, they're more opposite in their in their beginnings. That sounds pretty cool. And so, what, what kind of training do you actually do in the martial art? 
Um, my actually, my background. I started out doing uh, Kanan karate. Um, we, we did a lot of physical conditioning, a lot of internal um, breathing meditation type stuff. Um, we had a lot of the um, old school conditioning, uh, which is we have these clogs called geta, and they look like well, they're flip flops made out of um, metal. They're weights, and the main thing is throwing kicks slowly enough. So you can have a weight-bearing resistance, but don't have the clogs fly off and go through a window or hit yourself in the return falling down or you pull something because it, it's a heavy weight and sticking your hands in the sand and pebbles, just grabbing, um, crushing your fingers in there. And then um, I went as far as I could with that. And then I moved on to learn Jeet Kune Do. Um, it's an American hybrid martial art developed by Bruce Lee. It's a mix of Wing Chun Kung Fu with boxing, fencing, and some elements of judo and freestyle wrestling. I've always liked a lot of people It's really think... interesting to me, like with the whole Wing Chun uh, part of it. I mean, I've always been interested in Wing Chun, and I've always practiced the kinetics on my own. Um, just the Wing Chun style of the kinetics of, of how uh, hand-to-hand combat works. I'd love to get into a class. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I always found it really interesting, and it sinks in very well with, with everything that I do. I, I like I how always the mechanics believe... are very close in a, a personal, because obviously, you know, Bruce Lee could probably run 15 miles flat and just bam, just get it done, you know, away from a situation. But if you're actually up close to someone and they're trying to do something, his whole styling is get the problem solved and get out of the situation. What what I like about the philosophy, um, it it goes by if it works, use it. If it feels right, that means you're doing it right. If it's uncomfortable and off balance, chances are it is. So, and um, I found myself really liking this because I, I studied other systems and I found myself in very uncomfortable positions in, ter- in terms of stances and throwing techniques. And the dogma of that particular system will focus on that. And they would say, well, you get used to it. And whereas in Jeet Kune Do, well, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it at all. Why not adjust it to your body, adjust it to yourself? And I, I caught on to that and, and really stuck with it for a long time. And, um, and then my, my teacher started to get sciatica, so, so I stopped training with him because he's no longer teaching because he's very involved teaching. And I moved on to someone else, and he wasn't—he wasn't that great of a teacher. He was a bit of a candy ass. So at that point, it's not a matter of what style I'm learning. If the teacher is good and and valid, I don't care what he teaches, as long as I have a good interaction with him. And so after Jeet Kune Do, I started to learn uh, ninjutsu, as taught by the Budokan organization. I was training under this guy, Jack Hoban, for a good three years. And then there had been some internal conflict within his school, the dojo between senior students. And I kind of got caught in the middle of that drama. So I left and started training under this guy, um, Chris Carbonaro, who was a brand new teacher, shipped from Japan. Um, He was an American Air Force guy. Um, lived in Japan while he was stationed there, of course, and he got his black belt over there and went as far as to his, um, once he got his fifth degree black belt, then he started teaching. Um, but my, my training with him was roughly also a good three years. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I stopped training under him because he started to fall under, um, I'm the teacher, worship me type, type mode. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm, I'm not going to deal with you. You're a fag. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, that, that guy was very, very controlling. This other guy, Craig, um, he was a senior student, his top guy. I kind of nicknamed him Guido Bottom Guy because he tries <laughs> he tries way too hard to be overly macho. So I, either he really is gay and he's trying to cover it up, or he does he's involved with a sex from time to time, and he really is a bottom guy, and he's very ashamed about it. Or I don't know. That's those are the conclusions that I have from him. Why did you catch that just because he was being macho or because he was doing something to put you in between so he could get all up on your shit? Well, he fit a pattern that that I've seen growing up with people around me, with amongst, um, amongst athletes or amongst um, so-called alpha male wannabes. Okay. who press the alpha male thing a little too hard. I always felt the alpha male is something that comes out when you're in certain positions like like law enforcement or military or, or contracting, where you're always in a position of authority or you have to assert yourself to get certain things done. That's just the nature of the beast, and you need to do that, especially when you're dealing with hostile people on a regular basis. So you have to exude that alpha male, and it comes out. On the other hand, when someone really doesn't do anything, and he pushes the alpha male thing just to dominate over someone else for one reason or another, to a point that it's practically bullying, and I start to wonder what's really going on with that guy. And one day he was just teasing me because of my goth-ness. <laughs> and then he, was, then he started sh- to show off his um, tongue piercing. Oh, God. <laughs> and, and the first thing that came out of my mouth was the best blowjob I ever had <laughs> came from a girl with the tongue piercing. <laughs> it's it, 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 it a shot. <laughs> It just shot right right out. And everyone kind of looked at me. And and there was, I was looking at Craig, and he started to turn red, and there was some serious embarrassment. And he paused for a moment, and they started getting really, really aggressive with me. Interesting. And I started to think about it. Is he a gay prostitute? Or he really is a bottom guy. <laughs> well, he, he is some. Well, he's not exactly in shape, but he has somewhat of a build, and he's six foot tall. So there's some strength and muscle to him. But maybe he he falls under the category of um, power bottom. Although you are probably yeah. correct, and, and there are a lot of guys who uh, hide things either on purpose because, and ladies as well, who hide their true nature within them because within their chosen professions, it's, um, and actually this topic leads right into um, a topic that our resident ranger um, in the segment Ranger Speaks talks about. And I don't agree with him. This is his personal thoughts, so let it go. But he threw out this um, this article from the CBS San Francisco Bay Area um, website. So commission finds no compelling medical reason to exclude transgendered Americans from the military. An independent commission led by former U.S. Surgeon General has concluded that There is no compelling medical reason for the U.S. Armed Forces to prohibit transgendered Americans from serving and that President Barack Obama could lift the decades-old ban without approval from Congress, according to a report being released Thursday. Which is actually, that's probably actually true. I don't really know much about the UCMJ's uh, portion of that, but, you know, seeing that Obama's actually the president of 
the fucking military, not of the country, and certainly not of anything else other than the military. Um, that's actually kind of something which is interesting. Uh, the reports that Department of Defense regulations designed to keep transgender people from joining or remaining in the military on the grounds of psychological and physical unfitness are based on outdated beliefs that require thousands of current service members either to leave service or to forego medical procedures. I thought it was interesting that this article talked about how there's 15,450 transgendered personnel who currently serve in the active guard and reserve components of the military. Um, and you guys can read the, the whole article. Um, and this is Ranger Speaks comments on this. How about the continuation of policies designed to destroy and make a freak show out of our military? The latest chapter, trainees in the military, no medical reason. How about psychological? I am of the opinion that homosexuality is a mental disorder. Gender confusion is certainly one. We already have enough confused people in the military. Why add to it? I don't think DADT was perfect. I don't ask, don't tell was perfect. And no repeal was necessary. We are all green, not pink, blue, red, white, black, brown, or rainbow. <laughs> and that's a good one to, to Ranger Speaks. So if you've got comments on that, you know, that's, that's uh, you can just uh, throw down comments on it. And they, I'll put the, the, sh the links in the the show uh, notes for it so you guys can check that out. What do you think about that, Ryan? Yeah. Well, I, I know the, the Dutch, they, they have a, uh, they deal with homosexual issues in their military. And the officer and higher NCO ranks, they actually have to take a class in in dealing with homosexual issues, and they seem to have a pretty good handle on it. Um, when I was going through the ranks from both enlisted and officer, we knew who, who was homosexual. It, it pretty much spewed out as long as the individual was able to do their job and not press the gay thing on anyone else and does not do anything to anybody forcibly, a lot of us really didn't give a shit. And yeah, it's something that we... During both armies, right? The Don't Ask, Don't Tell Army and the uh, the former army, right? Right. That's correct. I, I saw the whole transition throughout um, from, from Bush, Bush Sr. to Clinton... When uh, when the Don't Ask Don't Tell came out, we there was a song called the Ballad of the Queen Berets to Pope Jess Davis. Are you familiar Ballad with the song? Of the Queen Berets. Queen. Yes. What? Yeah, you know, falling. Yes, yeah, so it, it was passed out words. in. Yeah. Say, falling fairies from the sky, broken nail. Oh, I could cry. Let's the way how my tushy sways, cause I'm a fag in a queen berets. <laughs> the silver clips upon my nut. I love the pain, now thank my butt. I once was scared, now I'm okay, cause I'm a fag in the queen berets. What Bill Clinton's hell? words upon my ears. You guys have right, be proud you're queer. Once I was scared. Now I'm okay, because I'm a fag in the Queen Berets. And then there's more lyrics You're after not that. Fucking with me. This is actually real. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, the, yes, this this was this was a <laughs> Yeah, the, this was this was a real song that was passed and out. And, and we <laughs> Yeah, we used to sing it. We used to sing it to each other. We we used to sing it so much that I even mem I, I know this I know it by verbatim. Too. You actually literally got them you weren't actually looking it up on the webs. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah, there's... <laughs> yeah, there's... I'm pretty sure, like, the lyrics will change here and there, but, but there's actual lyrics and stuff. Back at home, and a stuff. young wife waits. Her queen beret just won't go straight. From his time, he strays undressed, spreads his legs, and lies on his chest. This army stuff is really slick. 
free clothes, bunk beds, and lots of dicks. When we retire, we'll still get paid. Thank you, Bill, from the Queen Berets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, the, <laughs> well, well, the whole thing is that the military is actually having to deal with this. Because, you know, before, you know, the military was a conscripted military, and, you know, the whole swath of the male population was completely, you know, enveloped in this 1920s un... I mean, there was no individuality. It was entirely a conformed society. You were conscripted to do whatever you were told to do, and if you didn't, you know, go into the military, then, you know, you're a shipbird. Although, you probably had a better life because you were banging hotties back at home, which is probably the most genius plan ever. Um, but, you know, this is something that the military has never had to deal with, is the fact that now the entire population is a combat-ready population, because now you can't just say, oh, because you're a fag, you can't go smoke check the bad guy. Well, maybe you could be that one uh, ranger dude. I think he was a ranger. I can't remember what he was. Um, but he's a transgendered, uh, he's now a woman, and... He's trying to, she's trying to help out people to get into the military. Actually, Soft Rep's going to interview her in a couple of, a couple of weeks, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to check that out in the next week. Yeah, now, now my question is, with, with a transgendered soldier, now now you got to think of terms of health. Because we're, we're talking a major operation that's being performed. And, and that soldier or sailor, or whatever, that, that person, personnel, will, um, will have to go on duty within X amount of time. And what if there are complications from the operation that addresses while, while the soldier is in the field? This has been the, said the same thing about ladies in combat. So what if that boom needs a, needs a plug up her, you know, whatever, and, you know, this is where you have those people saying those types of things where... You know, God forbid, you know, what if she bangs some guy while on duty and then gets pregnant? You know, as if, you know, there's not billion-dollar medical facilities, which I can attest to. Uh, in the south of Afghanistan, there is a fantastic medical facility that I went to. It was a billion-dollar facility. Um, they're the ones who performed my, uh, my surgery to my hand. They can literally do anything. They have hand surgeons. They have neurosurgeons. They have every type of person you could think of that needs to work on somebody. So even if you've got um, problems with your your uh, pillowy parts, as uh, <laughs> as that guy from uh, The Onion has said, um, yeah, uh, there's no reason why you can't serve and uh, smoke check bad guys. So hey, smoke checking bad guys is smoke checking bad guys. <laughs> it don't matter who pull the triggers or sticks that blade. I said stick. So I thought this was kind of cool on ARS Technica. Um, in a sudden announcement, the United States to give up control of DNS root zone. In a historic decision on Friday, the United States has decided to give up control of the authoritative root zone file, which contains all names and addresses to the top-level domain names. The National Communications and Information Administration, the NTIA, under U.S. Department of Commerce, has retained ultimate control of the domain name system since transitioning it from a government project into private hands in 97. With the Commerce's blessing, the International Cooper Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, the ICANN, acts as a primary essential governing body for Internet policy. The new change is in advance of the coming ICANN meeting to be held in Brazil. Brazil and other nations have fumed at revelations of American spying on political leaders and corporations, which were first revealed in September 2013 as a result of documents distributed by whistleblower Edward Snowden. The South American country also threatened to build its own cloud as the consequence of NSA spying. Commerce contract with ICANN to act as an Internet Assignment Authority will expire September the 30th, 2015. For now, ICANN's role will not be changed. It's a pretty long and detailed article. You guys can check that out. I think it's pretty freaking sweet. You know, and then hopefully, 
you know, above the DNS stuff, you know, uh, I forget if it was ARS Technica or who um, was talking about it, but um, basically an Internet Bill of Rights that the webs cannot be controlled by the government or any authority. And uh, decentralizing the is something that's really important, in my opinion. What do you think, Ronan? Yeah, I, I agree with you. How could decentralizing the uh, the internet help people? Well, it's um, the internet is something that we use as our mass communication. It's our global telephone device, best way to put it. Um, on top of that, we, we use it to send a lot of documents and stuff. And and a lot of things that we really rely on it due to its speed and convenience and like the pace that we work in, it, it has become part of our daily life. And when when you decentralize it, it will um, it will one, it will keep um, Big Brother from interfering with with our day to day things in terms of um, of stopping progress. And with, and with that being said and done, we're able to move forward as um, as a society as a whole. Um, we currently right now, if if you go over the type of civilizations, um, like type zero, in which we're in, type one, type two, type three, as defined by Michio Kaku, um, we we are still in that developing stage, but we're getting close to a type one civilization in, in which what defines a type, the civilization types is the, um, is the ability to harness power sources. And in order to harness power sources, you need a, you need a technology to support as such. So, so type one civilization really is the, the mastery of our um, our planet's resources, like wind, sun, oil, we're not fully dependent on one. We we can do it. Um, type two civilization, we could um, we could harness the um, the solar system. And type three, you're able to to harness power systems of the entire galaxy. Uh, a perfect example of a type three civilization is the Intergalactic Empire and Star Wars, and the Type Two civilization would be the Federation and Star Trek. And well, why do I bring this up? And well, how does this coincide with the decentralization of the the internet? The uh, when it's centralized, it it has the elites, the powers that may be, that will put a damper on a lot of things. Um, if you leave it to certain people in the planet, they prefer that we are in a 0.4 type civilization, which is um, monarchies ruling in a medieval type setting. Um, only the elites, are, elites will have access to the technology that we have, that we are using on a daily basis, and everyone else is pretty much horse and buggy and and progress alone is slowly being halted um, I, I do remember um, Barack Obama at one time saying putting actually he actually halted the progression of our particle beam weapon once it was attached to a, um, a B-1 bomber and it actually shot down a number of drone targets and, and all of a sudden, he goes, he, he killed it, and he goes, no nation should be, well, his exact words, I believe, were, America should never be that powerful, first and foremost. <laughs> you, you we don't have the largest like army. Killing Americans even in Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, first, and for, first and foremost, we don't have the largest army in the world. And if we fight like straight on conventional without the 
technological advances, we would get our assets handed over on a silver platter to us 10 times over. And the reason why that we are... And, six years old, and, you cannot yeah. Touch me. yeah, yeah, and the reason why that we are as strong as we are is because the everyday person does have a measure of education, and measure of education gives you give you the means to create and use the technology that we have today, and that leads to higher development, and when. When you have a um, ruling class that does not want that and that prevents that, that pretty much halts progress forward. We become stagnant and easily controlled. And that's something that we are totally against. Yeah, and I, I really do see that how, you know, with our current systems with the Internet, the world is becoming a much smaller place. Um, Noam Chomsky, in some interview that I had watched from, I think it was an interview from like the 90s maybe or before, but he had mentioned how the first time in human history during the Vietnam War, um, when they first laid the plans for Vietnam, like, oh, hey, let's go and kill the, v the, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, because they're such bad people, um, for the first time in human history, had a people group protested a war before it happened. So the social consciousness, it, this is how he described it, the social consciousness of the American public in general was against going to war in Vietnam, and they had protested before that. So it was more peaceful people and less likely to just go off and kill people indiscriminately. I do find the Vietnam War curious because there was also an anti-Chinese sentiment within the government as well. And the funny thing is, is that China would have been our best friends in Southeast Asia. Best friends how? Because they would have supported us in the Vietnam War. Instead of utilizing propaganda and constant uh, warmongering towards them, probably sanctions. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, the a lot of the um, the VC, they're actually South Vietnamese. And most of the war fighting and, was going on in the north. You're saying. So the main army came from the north, supported by Russia. Um, how that came about, the Treaty of Versailles, Ho Chi Minh approached the United States ambassador and asked for aid in dealing, in dealing with, with his issues with Indochina, particularly the French. And our U.S. ambassador pretty much said, well, screw you, little man, you're nothing to me. And he snubbed him, and the Russians caught wind of this and said, hey, Ho Chi Minh, what's your problem? And Ho Chi Minh says, hey, I'm having this problem in China. The French, can you help me out? And the Russians go, yeah, we'll give you everything you need, but there's only one condition. You become communist like us, and you'll have everything. And he got it. There was no purpose yeah, so, of America being in there. I really just can't. <laughs> and, and, and the common, I, th I mean, just the common, you just ask any person who is from that era or descendant of that era or even our age now, <clears throat> none of, I mean, none of us would ever, oh, yeah, we should fuck up the Vietnamese. Oh, yeah, we should fucking smoke check them, nuke their entire country. No one would be able to say that with a straight face. Yeah, it's just another thing, even when you bump it up to current times. Um, the whole thing with the Ukraine and, and the Russian troops in Crimea. Um, technically, Crimea is Russian, not just people. I mean, it, it, it's Russian soil. Oh, is it? Um, 
Yeah, it, it is. There's, there was actually a treaty a, that was signed by the Russian Federation that states that Crimea will be part of Ukraine as long they're part of the Union. Oh. And, okay. yeah, and, and when the, and in the event that Ukraine does break away, they lose Crimea, and Crimea goes back to the Russian Federation. It, it's actually um, in law. I would actually that. like to interview. I mean, you wouldn't be able to interview, but I mean, just like even to kind of find out, like what the average Crimean person would say if they would even want either you, any of those systems at all in general, or if they would just like to become an autonomous country like Liechtenstein, Switzerland, or Texas. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's pretty curious. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, and, you know, I was born and, in Texas, and, and, and I, I cannot tell you how many people. I mean, if you ask someone from Texas where they're from, like, I'm from Texas. That I mean, they're like, no, you know, I'm from, you know, I'm from United States. I live in, you know, New York. No, I'm from fucking Texas. Like, I mean, it's like it's a country. Like <laughs> you refer to it as a country, and if you say that you were born in, yeah, I was born in Dallas, Texas. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I was born in the U.S., you know, or in Hawaii or some shit, you know. No. Like, you're born in fucking Dallas. You know, like, you're in Texas. <laughs> it's, and I would, I would suspect that maybe even the Crimean thing is kind of like that as well. It's, it's an autonomous place, and they don't even really, Russia doesn't even really represent them either. Yeah, Crimea, Crimea got absorbed by the Ukraine when the Union fell. And and at least, actually, there has been at least signed by the Ukrainian government that states that they, that Crimea is on loan until 2040. That's just some scary shit. So, <laughs> yeah, and... And, so and as a matter of fact, like people because they cannot determine their own way of life. So a person who's essentially fifteen or between fifteen and twenty-five right now doesn't have your own choice of the determination of where your life goes. Essentially, until you become of age enough to be able to, you know, cock back a AK and take out your leaders. You know, I mean, they don't really have that ability to. Existence is futile. You will be assimilated. <laughs> to quote more Star Trek um, quotes, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It just seems odd to me. No one questions. It. It's yeah, just, there's this. Yeah, you know, yeah. A, B, and C yeah, government fact, has to be in charge. I don't see it. Oh, but, they're yeah, they're they're totally. They're they're just they're just in a mess. They're just plain in a mess. I, I, mean, I spoke a with a. Essentially, we have a ruling <clears throat> government. We really don't have an elected government. It's not necessary. We have an electoral college that just decides who our leaders are. I mean, there's no direct democracy in America. <clears throat> well, no government is perfect. <laughs> How about no government? <laughs> no government is perfect. I I was working um, Hurricane Katrina. I was at FEMA headquarters as the um, as a liaison, as and a I was or a contractor. yeah. No, no, I, I was I was I was still um, I was still a captain. I was working um, military intelligence at the time, and I, I was I was one of the special operations um, liaison um, at FEMA headquarters. And the um, just watching day to day things, and one thought went through my mind was, "Oh my God, how did we survive in a country with with the government running like this?" The um, I always had my balls busted ever since I was a platoon leader. Make sure this is squared away. Blah 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 blah. Make sure you you prepared to act three steps up and make sure you disseminate clearly two steps down. 
and <laughs> that's just some military command bullshit. <laughs> yeah, and then and, and then I, I I go to you know teamwork makes the yeah, dream I, work. <laughs> yeah, and then and then I see things firsthand on the federal government level. I went, oh my god, whatever happened to all those lessons that was rammed down my throat? <laughs> Yeah, all these years, and and I see people doing doing things that should be labeled never do this, and they were doing this. What's even more interesting? And, I, I don't really want you to go into it, but I find it even more interesting that you were even allowed to be there at all. Anyone with an intelligence MOS in general as a standard of just an SOP in general. I mean, just a general SOP, no intelligence people on the ground at all, only admin people or only seaborne people to handle uh, chemical biological shit. I mean, other than that, I don't see how any other OMS would be allowed to be there unless you are doing something to help people as opposed to collect intelligence on people. <laughs> Yeah, so it was it was just very it was just very strange watching the federal government in action, or I would say a lack of action. <laughs> Lieutenant Worf, dispatch the subspace message to the Admiral Hansen. You will be engaged, Borg. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to go um, Schwarzenegger on some of these people. What's your problem? What are you, a girly man? <laughs> well, actually, um, it worked with the Californians, even though they complained and they were able to come to a decision. What do you mean? They, they were supposed to um, pass, on, pass on a vote, whether yes or no, for some action. I, I forget what it was. And, and Arthur Schwarzenegger was in the news because he busted their balls. And he pretty much went in front of the um, California Senate, Congress, their higher authority, and and totally insulted their manhood. He called them all girly men in public forum <laughs> because they could not come to a decision. They were just going back and forth. And and after he did that, they actually voted. They came to a decision. And then they started complaining that how um, Arnold Schwarzenegger made fun of their manhood. And they didn't like it because it hurt their feelings. We need water. You're a bunch of girly men. Yeah, that's pretty much what he said. I was hoping that Kerry Patton was going to have something up from his Valhalla thing on his website. He didn't... I don't think he put it up there. I don't know what he's... He must have, been, must have only been doing it on on uh, Facebook. Let me go to Facebook. Sometimes he posts stuff, like he, he writes for other people, and... You know, I, I have Arnold Schwarzenegger in the brain. I was watching, um, I was watching a bi biography movie of him while he was running for um, for governor, and someone threw eggs at him while he was doing the speech. So he started chasing after the guy, and the guy freaked out, and he and his um, partner in crime drove up in a car and the guy jumped in and Arnold was screaming, chasing the guy, yelling, where is my bacon? <laughs> what? There was another what? moment they had the, <laughs> because, because he got splashed by eggs, so he was expecting bacon. <laughs> I think he was disappointed because they didn't throw bacon at, bacon at him. And 
And there was another moment they had the the lesbian organization, and they were talking to Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they asked him his opinions about women. And he goes, I love women. I love women so much, I even married one. <laughs> Leave it to... Well, hey, now you know. Now that Obama's president, you know, they had to change the law for him, or just go around the law to, uh, you know, hire non-American-born uh, citizens to uh, become president. Maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger could be a, become our next president. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe I'll run too. Oh uh, yeah, where, where, where were you born? Yeah, but I was I was actually born in the Philippines. Oh shit! I came to America. Yeah, I now, came to America when I was three years. Civilian populace. On the civilian population. You're fucked. <laughs> yeah. Now you can't be our president. No, I can't. <laughs> so this is something. Well, of from, course, uh, if, from uh, oh, what were you say? You know, well, what if what if it comes out of the blue that is proven that Obama is not a American-born citizen? I hope that the Marines that surround him will take him directly to prison. That's their job. Their job isn't necessarily just to stand there and protect the guy. They should also be protecting the United States citizens from people who are defrauding the entire public by saying that they were naturally born in America. And there's a reason for that law, so that people cannot come in and run counterintelligence and give that information back to their host government that they were born under and you know have a reason to give that information over to whoever the other country is. And so I, I do hope that if that is found out, that the people that are around him, whoever is, is around him who has a clearance or who's sworn an oath to the Constitution, directly puts him in handcuffs and puts him in prison in, in uh, Leavenworth. That's my opinion. Oh, Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, that's there's a the lot law, of people waiting. Down to really, I mean, very, very broken down. But that's that's essentially the law, and that's exactly what should happen. Should be the steps. Any person who's sworn an oath or has clearance, you may not have sworn an oath, but as long as you have clearance, tell us throw the guy in cuffs, take him down to Leavenworth, put uh, just put him in prison for the rest of his life. If it's if it's proven that he was not born in America, certainly because he's lied about it. He's never told the American public the truth, so. Yeah, I wonder, if, I wonder if the public will ever find out. Maybe like in a hundred years. <laughs> Most likely after uh, the Skull and Bones, uh, you know, releases information later on. It well, is... he was kissing the lips by by Putin. Ugh. If that's not an entangling alliance, I don't know what is. I mean, America should not be involved in any of those situations. You know, if it's so much of a problem, people can get a Kickstarter. You know, they can contact my consulting firm, pay us money in my PayPal account, and we'll go out there and we'll fuck shit up. It's fine, you know. But, you know, making the entire public pay for all this bullshit with, uh, with any of those countries, it's, it's complete corruption. Well, yes. <laughs> Maybe I could be corrupt as fuck, and I'll run for governor from New Jersey. I think I'll get in being so corrupt. <laughs> Dude, you should run a fake campaign. I've been actually been meaning to do like fake campaign photos for my buddy, you know, <laughs> like have him kissing a baby, you know, like with a hard hat on with his like his suit cuffs rolled up, you know, stupid shit like that. Hey, I am Roman. I'm going to be governor. I'm hanging out at a strip club. <laughs> Bitches ain't shit, post tricks. <laughs> you know, I, I might actually get votes from that. <laughs> oh, God. So, on, on a yeah, you vote for note, me? Um, Carrie Patton has a uh, an article called Self Inflicted Wounds on uh, Ranger Up um, by Carrie Patton. So many veterans are hurting on the inside. What we have endured over the past decade plus. Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa has caused numerous mental issues needing to be dealt with. I just returned from the Bahala Project, and one thing I learned, one thing that stuck, struck, stuck with me the hardest, 
was the fact that so many of our brethren warriors are causing themselves self-inflicted wounds. The mental dilemma must be treated similarly to the physical wound. We must clean, treat, and allow healing. If we don't do this, we will continue with unnecessary pain and suffering. Imagine having a laceration on your arm and continuously piss picking at the scab every day for the rest of your life. How long will it take that wound to actually heal? Will it ever heal? We should know through the most basic medical schooling that we must clean and treat wound, wounds and allow it time to heal without picking at it. If we know this, then why are so many of our brothers and sisters causing themselves more pain than what is necessary? Pain that can eventually go away if we treat our mental wounds appropriately. The past week, I was asked to go to the Holly Project on behalf and its founder, Lieutenant Colonel, retired Cthulhu Gordon is a friend who served the prestigious Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group. If anyone understands the struggles returning from war, Gordon does. As I said, the 200-acre farm meant to serve as a decompression center for veterans and their contractual counterparts. I interacted with some of America's finest. We had several Marines, Air Force, Navy, and an Army Ranger present. Some were doing better in their transition to civilian life, and the others were struggling. One thing I realized immediately, though, it was those who were struggling more than the others were popping too many pharmaceutical pills, self-medicating, or drinking more than they should. Some learned the hard way about self-inflicted wound concept. In fact, one of the present is now bound by a wheelchair because he decided not to adhere to the advice of his buddies and instead decided, after one too many, to get behind the wheel. He's got some, uh, some videos on it. You guys can read a little bit more about it. Um, I really am impressed with uh, with Carrie. He, uh, you know, I'm not sure if he was ever in the military. I don't ever think he ever heard him mention. I, I haven't asked him directly either. But I mean, for me, I find it really important that we have someone that uh, is speaking out for those of us who are um, not soldiers or just contractors in general, because we don't really have a voice. You know, we're just the disheartened and the, the fucking, you know, unsung heroes, but, you know, no one actually speaks up for any of us. And uh, Carrie is really getting out there within our community and talking out about foreign policy as a non-interventionist and really giving a voice for us contractors, which is fucking sweet. And uh, I hope that he gets a medal for uh, his work, for sure. Yeah, we yeah. Some contractors have become the unsung heroes in in this war, and also as a matter of fact, um, contractors have been used ever since the United States had gone to war. Even when we were the colonies, we have used contractors, but people don't realize. Um, for example, the privateers. Yeah, we did we prior to. Yeah. So, so prior with, yeah, prior with us having a a navy, we we hired privateers to do such work, and and when I was talking to a couple of Vietnam veterans, um, matter of fact, um, today doing um, taxes, the um, they're saying that the um, that they couldn't get a lot of things done without the contractors. And some of them were right next to them in middle firefights. Yeah, that's and they met some of them. Or even talked about. I mean, even with guys who were directly associated with it, like, it's always, oh, this person is a former whatever branch of the government. But never, hey, this guy's a badass fucking contractor. He smoke checked out for many people and helped us. And he's a cool gentleman who never gave up the soldier and never gave up the civilian either. You know, which is, I think, really important. Well, yeah, well, well with, with many people, like, for example, uh, sometimes due to progression, sometimes to politics, a lot of soldiers have to leave leave service, but they still serve as a contractor. And unfortunately, many other soldiers, sailors, and Marines 
Like the newer ones, they fail to see this. They just don't understand because they're always being fed, oh, contractors, blah, blah, blah. They're, they're overpaid. They're, they don't work enough. Well, what, whatever. Who do you think they are to have these privileges where we don't? Well, if they actually from some E4 <laughs> or some <laughs> douchebag private. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like some, some, some E2, <laughs> E4. I, I even heard this from um, from a light colonel too, and a full bird. Uh, say the same thing. Are, no, I, I mean, you know, I, I study economics on my own. I actually sat down with a guy one time. I was like, okay, so tell me how much you make as your salary each month just deployed. Like, nothing else, none of the benefits, nothing else. He's like, oh, I make about $10,000, you know, a month while I'm deployed. I was like, so that doesn't include your medical. That doesn't include your BAH, your basic housing allowance. That doesn't include, like, all the other stuff that the government's paying you. He's like, no. I said, why do you, why are you guys bitching? I was like, you know, the most contractors ever really make is maybe about fifteen grand, and that's if you're doing direct action, like overthrowing fucking governments and shit. So if you're not doing that, you're only pulling down maybe eight. You're certainly not making what the professional supposedly officer is making, and certainly definitely not with all the other benefits because you don't get shit in most of these contracts. What do you think? Oh, that that is that is correct. That is correct. I I was talking to a couple of answers. And any fives over at Leatherneck about this, and, and they asked me how much I made, and, and I told them I was I was making um, sixty eight eight hundred for that year, and I was going to get a twelve thousand bonus at the end. And then they're saying, "Wow, that that's a lot." And I and I start to tell them like, "Yes, that is a lot in the paycheck, but on the other hand, I pay for my medical, I pay for this, I pay for that, and there's going to be a point that if push comes to shove, I may have to pay my way to get out of this country." If need be, you guys got a support system. Exactly. Yeah, to go back, if if you get lit up, you know you you're covered with medical. Yeah. For the rest of your life, I don't have that. I what I make, what's my bank account, that's going to cover me. And of course, you have the DBA, but as far as DBA is concerned, that's (laughs) Well, actually, so this is news for me. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, I was separated from the Defense Base Act. If you don't know, uh, Department of Longshoremen out of New York City is part of the Department of Labor's program for the Longshoremen, which is part of um, all those guys who do the ship building and all that kind of stuff. It ended up becoming part of the whole Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Africa wars, um, medical for contractors. But it only is medical for when you're injured. And just like the VA, they outright deny any claim that originally is put in. Um, now, for me, I got lucky. So I got two surgeries done um, for my hand. And after I got healed up the uh, same week that my doctor released me, um, the company I was working for separated me from employment. So technically, I do not have any more medical for my injuries, and I'm not receiving any more compensation either. So this is my big issue. So if you're a soldier, you're some bumfuck private, you get injured, you get the same thing that happened to me, where your hand gets cut, um, and you have to have, you know, a medical care, you know, uh, consistently, um, you're still getting paid for the military. But if you're a contractor, you just get separated from employment, and now you're like this guy, where I've applied for every major company possible, and every small-time little mom-and-pop uh, subcontractor, um, and all kinds of jobs in between that has nothing to do with the military, I've got nothing. And so this is a big issue for me, and I'm really confused about how um, people's minds aren't grasping the reality of contracting and uh, and uh, the differences between contractors and, and, uh, and military, and that support system that's there. People just take it for granted, really. And especially, I mean, in my opinion, veterans take it very for granted because they don't really know anybody who's just a contractor. 
at least me, I don't. Most yeah. of all the guys I've met have already, uh, have already served, and like in, in the military as a direct military employee. Yeah, and, and half of the um, half the contractors out there are retired military. Yeah, I mean, I would so. say eighty five percent of them. I mean, I've only met maybe three or four guys like me in my case. I mean, I really don't know many. And, and if they are, they're like IT guys, and they've got like. Or social science scientists and uh, doing science work for the government. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've met I've met a couple former Marines who became contractors working a Leatherneck doing IT stuff, and and now after after Leatherneck they're just they're just not deploying anymore. They they pretty much got hooked up doing doing their field out in the civilian world. That's good for them. I'm telling you what, I've actually been meeting a lot more different people who are, uh, well, different companies that just are trying to stay as far away from the government as possible just to keep themselves safe with their contracts. Oh, yes. They're just, they're just losing people left and right to a point that they're just getting mediocre people just to fill in the slots. Unfortunately, that is that is becoming um, the standard. This is I didn't know this. Article one, section eight, clause fifteen of the Constitution says, "The Congress shall have power to provide for calling for the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repeal invasions." I don't see anything in there that talks about direct action in other countries to combat bad people who may or may not be overthrowing your governments. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. This well, the National Guard has... Yes, I, I do remember in my National Guard days, we used to do civil disturbance like crazy, um, especially after L.A. riots. L.A. riots, that pretty much put the, um, the brick in our faces for, for the National Guard. Um, there had been a number of guys that's been around with the Newark, Newark and Jersey City riots back in the um, 60s. And, and since then, civil disturbance wasn't really practiced very seriously. It was pretty much you see guys get together with the billy clubs, and then they they do a formation, and then they just they just half-assed, just blow through it, and and they just knocked off that requirement for doing it. It surprises me how docile the the California people have become. I mean, after the L.A. riots, where you know during those riots, I mean, you had Korean gangsters <laughs> like. I mean, you just had regular Korean dudes with AK-47s taking out bad guys, like setting up observation posts on the top of their businesses and just smoke checking fucking bad guys, <laughs> just killing oh, yeah. people who are trying to you know get into their shit. And you know, this is just all over the city, you know. And and somehow the population has now become so docile that you know, that essentially you know you've got an occupying army of. Uh, of uh, L.A. County, you know, were just basically trying to just keep their state um, alive by taxation when their entire city is now bankrupt. You know, it's like, and nobody sees it that way. I mean, unless you kind of take it apart in each individual piece, you would never say, oh, the L.A. County police is an occupying army, but they are an occupying army. You don't have direct democracy over the laws or over who's policing you. And literally for L.A. County, it's a lot of people who live in Riverside, it's people who live completely far outside of L.A. County who are policing in that area. So if you're patrolling the ghetto, you're definitely not living in the ghetto. You're probably living out in Riverside or somewhere else, you know, in the middle of nowhere, instead of, uh, you know, living where you actually police. Yeah, they're probably living at Riverside, Palmdale, um... Victorville. Escondido by uh, Stone Brewery. <laughs> if they're smart. Yeah. Yeah, Valencia. 
which has a pretty good tilted tilt, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. Tilted tilt in um, Valencia, California. I've never is... been to one of those, although a bunch of their hostesses uh, tried to add me from the one in Ohio, and I was like, I don't know any of you people, and I would never date any of you people either. So I certainly find it pretty foxy, but I would never actually date one that actually dresses like that to go to their place of employ. That's just me. You know, I, I actually like like the girls from Tilted Chills. I, when I was on leave from Leatherneck, I went to visit California because I, I had thoughts on, on moving over there. Um, get a job out there or do more contracting and live out there because I really like the, the lifestyle, the nightlife, um, the culture. And, and I, I went first went to Dylan's, which was truly an Irish pub, like California style. The girls, they wore the, um, the green tartans, mini skirts. And instead of wearing the tilted chill top uniform, you know, which is, which is pretty much a simulated tied off shirt, the girls actually wore um, button down Oxford and they, they tied it off and they wore it very, very well. And I would say I probably fell in love a hundred times with every waitress and bartender there. And if they didn't wear the, wear the top, they, they wore um, some what's acceptable wear, short sleeve. And, and they were like metal docked out, tattooed out, and that was pretty hot. And I fell in love with my bartender. She was, I um, can't remember her name, but I do remember she was an actress. She gave me a free beer because I was on leave. <laughs> I, I, awesome. Yeah, I, I liked her voice. She has really soft hands and she smelled really, really nice. And it kind of like how her hair like like a slight cheek when she flips it around. So did you actually have a drink with this this uh, fox lady after you were there at the at the tilted kilt. Actually, no, because my friend wanted because he drove me there wanted wanted to take me to this hot dog place, which is famous for chili dogs. And I want to say a tilted kilt, but no, I want to go go check out these giant hot dogs. And and I'm thinking to myself, wow, isn't that a gay reference right there? This is why you gotta get your own consulting firm card, by the way. So you gotta get like, you gotta get yeah. like smooth cards like Ronin Industries providing, uh, disposing government's uh, abilities to military communities or something like that. You know, some cool buzzwords, you know, and, and you give your fancy cards to uh, the ladies who uh, are all about super duper contractor extraordinaires. Oh, Oh, you're gonna love this one. When I was flying, when I was flown out to um, Los Angeles for a job interview, the um, I met this slayer. girl. Um, no, no, no. I, I actually I was um, I interviewed for General Atomics for the um, for, for a position in the uh, in the um, UAV field, and. And I, while I was flying back, um, I had a stop over in Phoenix, and I met this girl who's from the Phoenix area. And we, our flight got pushed back for another three hours, so we're stuck in Phoenix for three hours. And and we're just chatting up a storm, and these people are upset. I'm just chilling out, and this girl, she was chilling out, and. You know, and we started to connect. Um, she was this blonde, maybe a little bit taller than me, five foot seven, full C cups. Um, I would say maybe like 120 pounds. Um, shoulder length hair. She smelled really, really nice. She wore this um, form fitting pants, tight t shirt. Um, it was it was a white shirt, and when the light hits it, you can see her bra. 
I was liking that a lot. And we had we had this um, conversation, and, and I told her, um, well, she asked me what I was doing. She says, oh, I'm flying home to New Jersey after um, an interview. And then we started talking, and she was telling me that she was a teacher, and I told her what I interviewed for. Yeah. And she goes, so, so you got interviewed by Tony Stark? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I did. Pretty much. <laughs> and she's like, wow. And she was well, like and really actually, into the it. The symbol for that company is the Lockheed Martin symbol, which is just turned upside down. It's pretty funny. Yeah, let's say triple canopy is a broken pentagram. Lockheed Martin <laughs> is a broken pentagram. General Atomics, it's an upside-down broken pentagram. <laughs> the most death metal fucking goth epic industries company ever. That's right. So did you end up uh, getting her number and calling her up later? Um, we became friends on Facebook. And... And then after that, I haven't heard any word again. So I'm like, okay, whatever. Well, you got to hit her up now, you know. Start a Kickstarter campaign for the Ronin to go out and go uh, take said yeah. fancy lady out. Hey, you know what? One of our bands for the show, Knights, is going to be in Japan. Um, I'm going to link their thing, their event thing. Um, so if you're a soldier in Japan... Uh, you'll definitely want to check out this band. We played them before. They're kind of like a psychedelic... I can't even explain it. Um, they're like a psychedelic rock band, in a way. Uh, they got a, uh, a girl singer. Um, and uh, Jenna, Jenna Fournier is uh, the lead singer of that band. And uh, they're really cool. And they've given us the ability to play their music a bunch of times. And, you know, it's been pretty cool for me because I, I really enjoy bands that allow you to be able to just play their music for your show and and uh, you know be able to promote them. So they're going to be actually in a lot of different cities in Japan. I, I don't see the, the tour uh, thing entirely, but I'll, I'll put it in the show notes um, for their band. So. Well, talking about bands in Japan, music in Japan, are you familiar with baby metal? <laughs> no. Yeah, they're... How do I describe them? But the goth metal meets J-pop oh, in anime. God. <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 God is right. But for some reason, just like train wrecks, I can't take my eyes off it. The girls are quite adorable. <laughs> and, you would. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, like, listening to their song, like, like halfway through, I, I just want to hang myself. <laughs> While watching this video, um, yes, it does sound like that. But but add add guitar riffs to that. Oh God! One, two, three, four. Uh, yes, 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 yes. You you have to. Yeah, just just look up in your spare time. Just look up baby metal fans out there. Just look up baby metal, and, and then just just give us our. Just give us your opinions. Oh, God, that just hurts. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's very disturbing, but for some reason, I just couldn't look away. I, I have to I have to watch the whole thing, and, and pretty much a part of me just want to hang myself while listening to this. <laughs> oh, so nights are going to uh, be I... in Tokyo at the Mars. They're going to be in Osaka at Konpas going to be in Hiroshima at the Cable. They're going to be in Kyoto at the Violet and Claire. They're going to be in Nagoya at Club Upset and back in Osaka at the 2670 Cafe. And that's from the 3rd of April to the 9th of April. So def if you're a soldier out there and you want to see some awesome American bands uh, or your dirty contractor out there um, in Japan, definitely check out Knight's band. Um, I'm going to link their, uh, their thing and you can check them out. They're pretty cool. Yeah. 
You know, I haven't heard their stuff. I think I'm going to look, look them up after the show and play the music. Oh, yeah. I, I was yes, just wondering um, actually play stuff during while we do stuff, but the, it's just too difficult. <laughs> you got to be, you have to have like an awesome setup to be able to do that. I, I really don't have a way to pump in music into a phone call at the same time while recording. That's difficult. And actually, I, I was actually trying to uh, to record us earlier, and I ended up like failing to turn on the monitor. I didn't know you had to turn it on individually with Audacity, so I ended up just plugging my phone. We're just recording the stream through the phone, so hopefully my vocals aren't going to be too bad. Yours will be fine, but mine might turn out pretty shitty. So. Oh yes, I uh, yes I I want to do a plug for Dracula's Fall. What's that? Um. Yes, it's a um, it's a goth event in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that's held four times a year. Um, it pretty much celebrated celebrates um, the gothic industrial music scene in in the Northeast um, and vampirism. It's going to be um, Friday, April the eleventh. Yes, April eleventh, oh, uh, nine to. Yes. Bella Morte, DJ Stagalia Mike. Yes, um, that like Mike. Mike, um... And, all, well, all ages are welcome, but 21 and older with ID to get drinks. That's correct, at the Trocadero Theater, which is in Arch Street, Philadelphia. Um, you could, if you could find street parking, then you could do it for free. Um, but if you want, like, indoor parking, where it's a little bit safer, drier in case of inclement weather, um, you could also park at the Hilton Garden Inn. And what you could do is you could get your parking ticket and get it validated at Tarcadero, and you'll just pay five bucks. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, so it's actually at the venue, the Trocadero Theater. Okay. Yes. It's at that venue. So. It's not, yes. So for years, it was held at Shampoo Nightclub, but originally it was held at Trocadero Theater the first time they had Dracula's Ball. And later on, they, they got Shampoo Nightclub, and Shampoo used to have, used to have their own fenced-in parking lot. Because Philadelphia isn't known for, for safe parking. If, if, you're not, if you don't keep your car clean, it's going to get busted into. And it's just, just like any other city. And, and when, um, when they had... Um, when Shampoo opened up to gothic events such as Nocturne, which is which was the Wednesday night um, party, and and Dracula's Ball became regular there, a lot of people started coming in, and that's mainly because because of the fenced-in area that Shampoo had. Um, since then, um, Shampoo got closed up because they couldn't um, they weren't paying their alcohol license, so that's the end of that club and. And Dracula's Ball has shifted around at different places since then. That was Sounds in, um, yeah, that that was 2013 when when Shampoo finally closed its doors. It, it was it was an end of an era. So sad, but but it was good to be part of it. I'm only seeing the. Yeah, usually two, three bands play at um at Dracula's Ball. Bella Morty is actually very good live. They are definitely the um, quintessential gothic rock band. Very, very droney, very, very doom sound. Oh, sweet. Okay, I'm really into doom metal, like Pelican and uh, Dodge. I can't remember. I listen to a bunch of other doom stuff, but it's it's just been a while. The sword. The, yes, I love the sword. Oh, you actually listen to them, really? I need to actually yes, contact them to see if they'll let me play their music because they're freaking sweet. Yes, Maiden, Mother, and Chrome. One of my favorite sword songs. Nice. I think How Heavy the Sax is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, in the last show that I did, I was talking about how uh, um, I got. 
who was able to talk to War of Ages, um, I was actually, I showed up to go to their show, and uh, I had parked at my bank's parking lot. And I was like, fuck parking in the regular parking lot. There's no fucking parking over there. So I'm like, fuck this. My bank is like, you know, all these parking spots across the street. So I'm like, fuck this. I'm, go- I'm just parking there. And I just happened to, like, walk up to the, the stoplight, and there were the guys, like, right there. I was like, holy shit, you guys are for age, aren't you? And I was like, yes, and started talking and whatever. And um, turns out that a lot of the guys live in, in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, they're all over the, the nation, really. There's some in Seattle, some are freaking everywhere, and uh, it was really cool. They're just regular dudes and fellow bearded gentlemen, so uh, they're not t box members, but uh, they're definitely uh, bearded gentlemen, so it's kinda, it was kind of cool. They just have normal lives, They're just dudes our age, 30s and 40s, and got kids and real lives, and work at gyms, and just do regular shit, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, do you know any of the people, any of the bands from, uh, like, Rasputina or Bella Morte? Do you know any of those, those people in those bands? No, I don't know them personally. I've... I met them when they played at Dracula's Ball and at other menus. Venues. And are they actually um, from Philadelphia or? Um, some of the bands are. Um, Bella, Bella Morde has been a regular at Dracula's Ball. Um, not just performing, they actually attend it as, as a patron and just do just the party along with everyone else. Um, they're. Oh, there, there has been, um, trying to remember the one, oh, Eagle Light Likeness, goth rock band. They, they party on a regular basis. I, I, I used to see them at Nocturne, uh, when they're not on tour, uh, which is the Wednesday night party. And, and they are regulars at Dracula's Ball, if they are not performing as well. That's pretty sweet. Um... There's another band um, based out of Tampa, Florida. Um, not not Camelot. Um, they're another goth rock band. Um, the lead singer is Rogue. He was actually partnered up with um, Patrick Rogers, who runs who runs Dancing Ferret in Philadelphia, which which he has a, a company called Metropolis Records that does that has a lot of Gotham industrial music under his label. Oh, cool. Um, Crook, Sh- Crook Shadows. That's it, Crook Shadows. Um, they're, they're not, they're actually a Florida-based um, goth, goth rock band. How do you spell it? Goth industrial rock. But they, um, but they are associated with Patrick Rogers out of Philadelphia. Um, like I said, Eagle Likeness, they're all, they're Philadelphia-based. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm trying to remember what Bella Morte. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, Bella Morte. I think they're Virginia. Virginia, yeah, Virginia. Charlottesville. Um, Angels on Acid. They're from, I believe, North Carolina. Either Virginia or North Carolina. But the, but they're regulars in a lot of the Philadelphia venues. They they play a lot in our area, and they and I've also seen them play at at a number of fetish events that I've attended. Oh, that's cool. Bell Morse actually has some decent music videos. And they're not gonna yes, be yes. It's an, an actual music video with decent uh, lighting and uh, some. Uh, I don't. I'm not listening to it, but at least decent. Uh, ideas for videos, so that's kind of cool. I have them right now. They have 47 videos, so that's kind of cool. And they get 200,000 uh, views. Shit. <laughs> well, I guess I need yeah, to get a different they're... type of band. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's... Um... Yeah, they're very... Um, they're very death rock. Sweet, okay. They're very death rock style. Um... I'll have to play some of Carly Brothers' more. stuff. I don't remember what bands she's had. Um, we'll have to have her on the show eventually, too. She's uh, an ex-Navy aircraft person who 
was uh, the goth chick and uh, just a regular just rocker chick of our generation. She's got all kinds of stuff. She's modeling. She's a singer, guitar player, drummer extraordinaire. She could fix aircraft. She's a woman's woman, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, are you familiar with Angel Spit, Aesthetic Perfection? Yeah, I've heard of them. I've never, I haven't listened to them in a long time, but I have, I've heard them mentioned before. Yeah, um, Angel Spit's been to Philadelphia a few times. They're, they're actually based out of Sydney, Australia, and, and they also fall under Metropolis Records as well. Um, Kami Christ, uh, Clan of Zymox, Hands on Gretel. Lords of Acid, they, they all fall under Project Pitch, Pitchfork. Um, they, they fall under um, Metropolis Records, based out of Philadelphia. And surprisingly to me, I, I found out that the Crooks, they're a German band. Oh, really? um, very big in Europe. Yeah. And um, Strapton, um, Suicide Commando, Terrafac, they also Funker, Funker Void, Frozen Plasma. They're, they're also Metropolis Records out of Philadelphia. Yeah, I'm going to And I'm gonna even, um, them, uh, hopefully they'll let me uh, play their music. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, you, even Covenant. Covenant falls from the Metropolis as well. So. And these are, those are bigger bands that's on the label? Yeah, the, yeah they're, they're the bigger bands on the, na- on the label. Um, yeah, VNV Nation I found to be very and, and Volshun they're very popular um, once, once Cut um, they're very I would say they're very truly industrial I, actually it, it's this one guy he doesn't go on tour and he has a computer and, and a bunch of keyboards and puts everything together and that's it he never goes on tour because he's He's a bit of he's a bit, um, stage fright. No, really. Yeah, so he just no, puts really, out albums and with the, with the internet these days, there's really not a point to do large tours that cost a lot of money. At least like lots of, of national travel or lots of uh, like out, outside of your immediate area. Um, and, and although for someone that's based in Philadelphia, it's actually a fantastic place to be a label because really you could just play up and down. The, the seaboard play in D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and, you know, down in Miami, and just stay within that area, and you get a ton of people to listen to your stuff, and eventually, you know, have people do maybe a Kickstarter campaign, be able to play West Coast or something, but really, I, I, I really don't see how, like, if you're a un, like technically an unsigned band, like, if you're, if you just have a distribution label, and you've got someone like Metropolis backing you um, just for, for, like, free promotion or, you know, some sort of promotional thing, and they just handle all your media inquiries and stuff like that, um, that actually really does help you. And you. Really, essentially, you don't really need the tour. I mean, it takes the money aspect out of, of having, to, having to do the music because it's it really can be a detriment to your, to your music if you're constantly spending money uh, beyond tour. Oh yeah, yeah. You you're not you're gonna spend a lot of money just traveling, just traveling costs alone. Well, um, this band, um, Joan Zetta, and uh, they're I'm not sure how popular they are now, but they were fairly popular uh, four or five years ago. A lot of people were listening to them, but they weren't making jack shit, and they were completely beholden to the record label, and they had to pay, or they had to make pies sell pies outside of their shows just to go from one show to the next show because they didn't have enough money to drive to the next show. It was ridiculous. And, you know, I think those guys are all in different bands now and stuff like that, but um, it really put the thought in my head, you know, signing on to a label may not be the best idea unless you know what you're doing. Or if it's like a free label where they don't charge you any money and they just, you know, do it for the bottoms of their hearts, you know, or the, the lack of hearts <laughs> of their souls to, uh, to help you out, you know, because, jeez, man, had to pay back a record label for, you know, a $100,000 loan for five guys. Fuck, man, that's, that's horrible. 
Oh, that yeah, that that is that is horrible. Um, talk about bands traveling. A lot of the '80s metal bands they gained a lot of a lot of popularity in in Europe and Japan. And there was a documentary done about this one band, and they're, while they were traveling all through Eastern Europe, and you get to see a lot of their frustrations because they, they would travel and then they would hit a club, and there'll be three people there. And then that's it. And then these guys in their heyday, they would, they would, they would be the headliners, and they would have stadiums just filled. And then now, now they they were they were booked by this club. You go to a show, and then they would go over, but they they couldn't even get paid just to just entertainment costs, and they have to pay for gas and wait. What was that movie travel. back in the eighties about that? It was like a spoof movie. Oh, Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap, yes. And that was the music industry. I mean, it, it was a spoof movie and making fun of the music industry, but, I mean, that's that's the reality of the music industry, which most people don't know. It's actually what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to remember the name of that band in, in that documentary I was seeing. I, I think it was, um, I think it was Manowar. That was. Um, I haven't listened to them in a long time. Yeah. Before I, um, before I left for, for Iraq in 2011, working for SLC, I saw, I saw Manowar, Megadeth. Um, um, oh, they're from they're from the south. Another metal band. Mailing the um, Man of War. Nah, nah. Um, I, I I can't I can't remember the I can't remember the name. It escapes me. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Opeth, they played, um, oh, Arch Enemy, yeah, Arch Enemy, oh, L- Lamb of God, that's it, Lamb of God. Ah, oh, you know, I don't actually like Lamb of God, that band, but I do like Burn the Priest. The Burn the Priest original stuff is outstanding. Yeah, the, um, so I, I saw all those bands wow, that's really the cool. week before, the week before I left for Iraq. That's the exact kind of concert I would want to go to before I would deploy. That's fucking sweet. Well, hey, we got to end it yeah. there. We're kind of uh, a little bit further on into our uh, our thing. But uh, you got any uh, last comments for our viewers? Oh, yes. Do you have any last comments and for I... uh, our viewers? Um. Slayer, awesome. Slayer's awesome. Slayer rules. And so does Motorhead. <laughs> I think we'll end it there. That's been Death Metal Chronicles episode 18 on... What was the thing that people should go to in Philadelphia? Dracula what? Um, Dracula's Ball. Dracula's Ball. Dracula's Ball. 